Thank you. And this one's from Jill Phillips in Nashville. How do we act while we're waiting for governments and legislation to catch up? Catherine? That's the question that I get the most frequently. And so as a scientist, I'm more used to talking about the problem than how to fix it. But I'm so happy that there are many ways that we can engage at the individual level and as a community. So Climate Stewards, Brian Webb right there is one of its founders. Climate Stewards is, climate an, oh, no, climate, caretakers. climate caretakers. I apologize. I was going to do Climate Stewards next. Climate Caretakers offers suggestions every single month of what we individually can do. And if it's something we've already, already done, then there's step two or even step three. By acting together, we can measure the cumulative value of our actions and we can feel hopeful as opposed to feeling like I'm the only person doing something. And then for those emissions that we cannot reduce or that we make the choice, such as coming here, that it is important to do, that's why I appreciate what Climate Stewards does. Churches are working together. I was so inspired by your vision of putting solar panels on every church and mosque in the Philippines. That is already happening in North America. Churches are offering their roof to the community as a community solar garden that members of the community, not just the church, can buy into and support. So there are many things that we can do, and there are many things that are already happening that we can join in. And that's what encourages me the most. Speak to that. Other? You want yeah. to answer that one? We don't have to wait for the government. Let's run after the government. Let's try to uh, connect with the government and say, this is an issue that we can offer help, and you have the law structure, we have the people, we have the volunteers. Let's work together. And I'm glad you said that because that reminded me of one more important thing. As an individual, it's often to figure out, it's often hard to say, well, how can I run after the government? You have a very nice position with a good connections and much more influence than just the average person like us. And so that's why I appreciate Citizens Climate Lobby, who I know is here today, began in the United States, spread into Canada, into Europe, has chapters all over the world, and it's all about helping us as individuals connect with our elected officials and our government and tell them this is what we care about and this is what we want you to do on our behalf. And during election year or during the time of election, make climate change an election issue. Uh. Thank you. And I'm afraid just one more from the tweets. Um, here we go. This is from Sandra McCracken, who we know, a singer in Nashville, uh, has said, how can the church participate water, electricity, ideas? It's sort of been covered, but you might have a few more for Nashville particularly. Okay, yeah. I, th I think tackling church leaders is, is a really important thing in my mind. So if your church leader sees this as a marginal or irrelevant issue, then give them something to read <laughs> Ask them, please, will you preach on this after you've read it? Um, I can recommend some books if you want some recommending. Um, but get them to actually think about the issues. Because the Bible's full of this stuff, but most church leaders just have never been trained to think about it. And if you have influence in, in how ministers get trained in seminaries, that's a really important area that, and one that we're working on. So that's a, at the kind of the strategic level. Others can add some other things. I suppose I'd <coughs> be good to talk about, uh, certainly in the UK, we have a program called Eco Church, which is about to be relaunched by Arosha in January, Eco Congregations, and I think there may be others in other countries. And it's a great way of churches taking practical steps throughout sort of doing a kind of audit of church life, both individually and congregationally. Thank you. Has anybody got questions? There's a roving mic. Uh, going to zoom around and just admit. Um, yes, <coughs> yes, hi. Um, I had a question for Carolyn. I really enjoyed your presentation. I have to admit, I've been very um, skeptical about offsets. I've never purchased them because uh, they seem kind of like a panacea that doesn't really go after the real problem. But your presentation was quite convincing. And I just wondered if you could make a few more comments um, about how you do the translation and, and how you assure that it's actually you know, compensating for the carbon that's released. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, and I think it's in a lot of people's minds when they, they hear about carbon offsetting. Um, so we work very closely with our partner organization, Arosha Ghana. We have a good relationship with them. Our, our project there was designed to meet accreditation standards, so there's a whole series of uh, issues which are covered in that in terms of 
relationship with the local community, permanence, to ensure that they are, the projects are genuinely additional, uh, that there's no leakage, so people don't, don't kind of plant trees somewhere else, in one place and chop them down somewhere else. There are a whole series of, of, of criteria that we have to meet. Um, we also, in, a, in the projects in uh, Mexico and in Kenya, they're also accredited by third party uh, accreditation agencies, Gold Standard and Plan Vivo, which do very thorough audits of the work that they're doing and make sure that those, those carbon uh, savings or mitigation is, is guaranteed as far as possible. They're also, the, the, the estimates are conservative deliberately. So they build in buffers, they build in insurance buffers of some 10, 20, 30% sometimes, especially in uh, forestry projects, because they recognize that some trees die, there are fires, there are pests. So I think all of those things together make, hopefully make quite a comprehensive and uh, a, a guarantee or a certainly a co give confidence that they, are, they have a, 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 of integrity. Thank you. Another question. At the front here. Right at the front. Third lady there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm Christine Christophe. I'm um, responsible of an association in France which name is uh, Chrétien Uni pour la Terre, which is uh, United Christian for Earth. Uh, we are quite lonely. <laughs> We'd say we work with Arosha sometimes. Um, my question is uh, further how can we manage to uh, work together in an um, uh, international way uh, between uh, Christians? I was uh, at the conference of uh, Catholic uh, Engage for Climate this morning, and there are the Catholic, and there are the Prot Evangelic, and, and there are the Orthodox, and uh, there is our voices, which is working on an interfaith uh, program. I don't know yet if we Christian have an international organization for ecology, uh, climate. Uh, I don't see it. <laughs> okay, who would like to take this one? Dave, have you got anything? Or yeah. Bishop F? Well, uh, from the World Evangelical Alliance, we have the uh, Creation Care Network, and uh, also Lausanne has the Creation Care Network, and we're trying to make sure that the the two networks come together so that we can have a global uh, network for um, those that will really be caring for creation. Yeah, for the Christians. Now, after the Christians are able to come together, then I would challenge them to say, let's reach out to the other faith-based groups. Uh, because like in the Philippines, what we have done, uh, I initiated gathering all the other faith-based organizations and say, let's work together for a common good that we need to address. It is sometimes easier to, <laughs> to work with our faith than in, in between Christians. Uh, I know about that. <laughs> Thank you. Another question from the floor. Samuel, have you got a question? <coughs> oh, you have one here. Okay. This is for Sarah. I'm not maybe a little off topic. I saw something on television a few years ago. And if you are who, are who I think you are, did you ever convince him? Your father? Oh, um, no, you're thinking of my friend Anna Jane. Is Anna here? No? Okay. So Anna Jane is here. I was the one who came in to try to help her. But what, so he's referring to episode four of the Years of Living Dangerously. Um, Anna Jane's father is a minister and he leads a big Christian organization in the U.S., he doesn't think climate change is real, and, Sarah and Anna Jane works for the Sierra Club on their Beyond Coal campaign. So the episode focused on Anna Jane trying to convince her father that climate change was real. And here's what happened. What happened is exactly what the social science literature on sociology and psychology predicted. If rejecting the reality of climate change, um, if rejecting even some of the core values of our own faith, is part of our identity. If we see ourselves as having a certain identity that culturally requires rejection of the reality of climate change, then arguing about it simply strengthens our resistance. 
especially arguing the facts, the data, and the science. And that is unfortunately exactly what happened with her father. And so that's why when we talk about climate change with people who don't agree with the science, um, I'm assuming there's not too many of those here, but where I live in West Texas, I would say probably 80 to 90% of the people do not agree with the science. I don't argue the science. I start with the values that we share, and as Christians we share so many values. I connect those to the impacts we are already seeing, and then I talk about solutions that we can all agree to. Solutions that help the poor, that invest in the economy, and that allow people their freedom to make their own choices, because that's what people in the United States are so afraid of, is losing the freedom to make their own choices, which seems kind of ironic. Um, so anyways, that was really interesting. If you have not seen The Years of Living Dangerously, I would encourage you to do so. They will be at COP filming this weekend for season two. So there's a season two coming out next year. Thank you. Any other questions that we have? It's very difficult to see with the light here. <laughs> no. Well, how would you like to just um, sum up each one of you, um, what you've got out of this and learned from each other. That would be really wonderful. So starting with Catherine and then going down the line, and then I'll, I'll finish off. So a bit of a summary, five minutes, a bit less, two, three minutes each. Okay. Just on the summary each. All right. Thank you. Uh, I was sitting here thinking that this is one of the favorite panels I've ever been on. <laughs> I loved every presentation because although each person on this panel's expertise is so unique, and although each person had such different things to say, I think that you could probably also see the common thread that ran through all of them. And the common thread is that no matter what our expertise, whether it is in ecology, social action, science, or theology, that the reason why we care and the reason why we are doing what we are doing comes from the same place. It comes from a respect for God's creation, and it comes from a deep and abiding love for others. Even, in some cases especially, the people we don't know. Sometimes it's harder to love the people you do know <laughs> than the people that you don't. What I love is that this same motivation can express itself in so many different ways. What each of us are doing is completely unique, but it's coming from the same place. So when people ask, what can I do? There's no one answer because each of us can express our own unique personality and gifts and abilities in totally different ways. Again, coming from the same foundation, but bringing that incredible diversity to our knowledge, our study, and our solutions to climate change. Well, I want to go back to my analogy of the four-legged table or four-legged chair. We are one of the legs, but we cannot do it alone. We need to work with others. We need to connect with others. We need to partner with others so we can make a difference. Um, as Sarah said earlier, I came to, bi to Paris by bicycle. I, I cycled from uh, Somerset in, west in the west of England. It was 300 miles. It took six days. I was with a group of people. And on the Friday, last Friday, we all arrived in Paris. So that's this time last week, isn't it? Um, and we had this extraordinary reception uh, where all the pilgrims came together. There were hundreds and hundreds of pilgrims, all mostly Christians, not all Christians, but largely Christians and people of other faiths and some of no faith. Uh, but we had this reception where people so told their stories. We sang songs, we shared. People had carried water from the Arctic and soil from Germany and people had cycled from Vietnam. Some, one couple cycled 16,000 kilometers from Vietnam. Yeb Sano was there with his group who had walked from Rome across the Alps. It was an amazing, powerful time. And the next day, we went and we met with Cristina Figueres and various other people. And again, we kind of told our story and we handed in the, our petitions and our letters. I brought a letter from my bishop uh, where I live. And Cristina Figueres, as she took the stage, she burst into tears. Uh, it was incredibly moving. Um, and she, she was just overcome, I think, by the, the power of the, the, the combined power of all these people who had sacrificed. I mean, I don't feel I've sacrificed very much, but some people had really sacrificed a lot and taken time out and were praying and praying and fasting. Um, and I think she needs our prayers. <laughs> 
because she's on our side, you know, and, and I think that collective force of faith groups is incredibly powerful, and I think perhaps for the first time this COP that has been really seen and evidenced. So um, let's keep going. I, I think for me what, what, what we just heard from Catherine about the fact that, that, that arguments about the facts are not going to change anybody's mind. Um, it, it's about values and it's about what, what's really important. And if you, like me, know lots of people who maybe believe in the science, but it seems to make absolutely no difference to their lifestyles, their political choices, or anything else. And that goes for most of our political leaders as well. Well, what, what touches people at the personal level? I think it's stories that are very personal, and it's, it's prophetic action, if I can call it that as well. It's, it's, it's when people go, boy, what then made them do that? And that prophetic action might be cycling from Somerset to Paris, or from Vietnam to Paris, or walking across the Alps. But it might be that you suddenly start turning up at church or at work on your bicycle instead of in your car. It might be that you spend twice as long going around the supermarket because you're bothering to read the labels and find out where things are coming from and make some differences to your lifestyle as a result. And if I think of what's really touched me <laughs> over the last couple of days, it, it's a good friend of mine who's a professional biologist and ecologist based in the UK, but she's originally from India. And it's seeing her Facebook posts about what's happening in her hometown of Chennai and the terrible floods that are going on there. And Chennai is a city I know quite well from my own childhood. But to, to see one of the world's great cities completely submerged. And of course, cities get flooded. Not all events are linked to climate. But to recognize that this is exactly what we're going to see more and more of in more and more places around the world. And these are real people, and these are real places. More than 50% of our population globally now live on coasts, uh, and more than 50% live in cities. Uh, and it's affecting people, it's affecting wildlife the world over. Tell the stories, share the stories, and do the actions, and I think that's what really changes people. To sum up, I think we have to say a big thank you to all our panelists, and I think there is hope for the future, and we have to pray very hard for the result of this COP21. Um, I think we've all been given a bit of courage to do different things slightly differently, and a different viewpoint um, can be taken home by every single one of us. So thank you very much, but before you clap or whatever, stamp your feet, say rah rah, um, can I just ask you all to make sure that you sign up, you know, your name, where you come from, or we can all be in touch, because it would be very good to have, to follow this in the future, all together from the people here in the room. There's a piece of paper at the back, and there's also bits of paper going around for you to sign um, your names and organizations, and we'll see what we can make of this. So thank you very much, and thank you to the panelists. Don't forget to sign up and take a piece of paper, one of these. Thank you. Thank you very much.